Hello, and welcome to LGTM on Cloud Native TV. Hello and welcome. My name is David McKay. You may know me better as Rocco. Today is LGTM and we're taking a look at contributing to Container D with the wonderful Phil Estes. Hey there, Phil. How are you? Great. Good to see you again. <laughs> how are you? Very well, thank you. Uh, thank you for everyone tuning in. Please feel free to use the chat to ask us questions along the way. And also remember this is a CNCF event and as such is subject to the code of conduct. Please be respectful to myself, to Phil and to everyone in the chat. Thank you. All right, Phil, can you do us a favor? Uh, just give us a quick introduction about you and then we'll talk about today's plan for today. Sure. Um, yeah, so... Um... You know, I guess for today's uh, topic, maybe the, the most interesting thing is uh, just how much I've been active in the uh, container runtime community for six years or so. Um, so that started with uh, getting involved in Docker in the early days of the Docker open source project, um, working some in the OCI and run C, uh, and then focused a lot on Containerd the last few years. So um, my employer is AWS. I was at IBM for a very long time, uh, but now work at AWS where uh, we use Containerd across uh, quite a few of the services, uh, Fargate and EKS being uh, two of the most notable. Um, so yeah, I've been, um, you know, involved in this part of the community for a long time and, um, yeah, excited to share with folks how to kind of how Containerd is is put together uh, as a project and how you get involved. So yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, we're we're really excited for today's episode and walking through Containerd and how can how, how to contribute. You know, that is the the purpose of LGTM is to give anyone watching at home who's thinking I'd love to contribute and I don't know how to get started. Well, that's why we're here. And uh, for Container D, there's just there is no better person than you, Phil. So we're really looking forward to <laughs> sitting down and uh, getting a, a nice overview of the different components, the code, the tests, the builds, all of those things. We're going to pluck them out your head and share them with our viewers today. Yeah, great. Excellent. So for for the people that maybe aren't entirely comfortable or confident and maybe describing what container D is. Can you give us the high level overview just of what the project is uh, and maybe upstream adoption, what's it used for, et cetera? Yeah. So um, like I said, container D has, uh, I said a couple of years, but I guess officially uh, it's been around for, for longer. It's been at least five years since the code base started. Uh, but I think kind of an important data point there is that Containerd had a shift in, in its life in late 2016 and early 2017 from just being sort of a, a process supervisor that was used by Docker, by the Docker engine, um, to manage the life cycle of Run C. And so again, that's the open container initiative, low level runtime that executes containers uh, on Linux. Um, so it started its early days as, a, as quite a small project that just sort of did this, this uh, intermediary role between Docker, the broader kind of runtime engine and run C actually, you know, working with the operating system to create your containerized process. Um, but then late in 2016, um, we announced uh, along with Docker and other, other people in the community that Containerd would grow into a more complete container runtime. Um, for example, it, it would have registry interactions. It would have snapshotters for how your, your images are stored on the local file system using different copy on write uh, file system providers. 
Um, and so Containerd in that kind of late 2016, early 2017 era uh, became more than just this process supervisor and really became a container runtime uh, that was more focused around just those core capabilities um, uh, to kind of fit the the niche of those who didn't need the full Docker ecosystem of plugins and volume uh, management and networking. Um, and so Containerd uh, initially uh, fit into the announcement of Kubernetes CRI, the Container Runtime Interface. And so initially Containerd had a CRI plugin that made it kind of the perfect match for being the container runtime for your Kubernetes cluster. And so that same year, 2017, Containerd was donated to the CNCF. Uh, many new contributors showed up. Uh, many more, you know, cloud providers and other kind of downstream users adopted it or started that process of shifting, for example, the managed Kubernetes services from using Docker uh, to Container D. And of course, that took some time to migrate and, and for Container D to mature. But uh, effectively, uh, you'll find Container D used pretty heavily in cloud managed services. Um, in you know, functions as a service offerings. Uh, I know IBM uses it um, in, in some of their functions as a service offerings. Uh, Alex Ellis has FASD, which embeds Containerd. Uh, Darren Shepard and the Rancher team created K3S, which embeds Containerd. And so there, there's really a broad set of kind of uh, consumers of Containerd as kind of this core container runtime uh, you know, some of those use cases I just mentioned, you know, one of the benefits is it's embeddable. It's, uh, it has a, a nice Go API that can be used from other Go programs, either as a client or even embedding the entire server like K3S uh, does. And, um, so, yeah, we've seen tons of growth in that, uh, you know, last three to four year period, um, both in usage, but also in contributors and and people involved in the project. So it's, it's, it's been great. It's been a healthy uh, project. We graduated in the CNCF uh, a couple of years ago. Um, and so, you know, stability, uh, value uh, to the ecosystem, um, good governance and, and contribution uh, from a lot of different parties. Um, yeah, it's, it's been a great project. Awesome. Uh, yeah, I think the I'm always surprised uh, when people say they're not using Container D, and then when you really look at their stack of what they're using, you realize just how far and wide Container D is. And actually, we're almost all using Container D now if we're running containers with Kubernetes or any of these other, you know, serverless style tools. So yeah, I think the success of the project is apparent just by the the, the adoption of the tooling across the board. Um, so that's awesome. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, today you're going to kind of give us a, a quick code walked through tour. Uh, we're going to take a look at the different components. Um, I'm going to prod you with loads of questions as we go, and then we will take a look at the development experience as well. So I will bring your screen up here. And if you want to just take it away and I, I'll do my best to ask questions. Yeah, great. Um, so I'm starting in, in maybe kind of a, a unique spot. We have a Subrepo called Project, which as Containerd grew in, in kind of sub repos, we needed a common place to put contributors guide and governance and the official maintainers list, uh, security details about how to report security issues. So that's all here in Containerd slash project. Um, again, there's not a, a ton to look at here, but I also thought this would be good to, to jump in um, and talk about sort of two kinds of projects you'll find in the Containerd list of repositories. Most of the projects uh, within Containerd are what we call core projects. So the same list of maintainers all have uh, right authority uh, to all those sub repos. And many of them are vendored into the Containerd project. So when you build Containerd, there's a certain uh, release or, or hash of that sub project that's included in the vendoring. Um, and so those are what we call core projects, the, the same governance applies. Um, but we added um, a few um, 
uh, maybe it's been a couple of years now, this idea of non-core sub-projects. And so these may have additional maintainers. It may be sort of an area that's aligned with ContainerD, but not really core to the project itself. And um, so anyway, there's definitions here. And if you read the whole governance, uh, you'll see, you know, the slight variations. Um, but, you know, we'll look at some of those, uh, but I think it's just as you're looking through the repos, it's good to uh, to kind of understand the difference between what we call sort of the core container D project, um, as well as these non-core sub-projects. Uh, in fact, you know, just here near the top of our list of repos, uh, StarGZ, Snapshotter, NerdCTL, TTRPC, um, Rust. Uh, these three projects are non-core sub-projects of ContainerD. Um, they've been brought in because they're interesting to the project as a whole. And StarGZ Snapshotter, for example, can be built into ContainerD for, um, con for a, a, a lazy pull container uh, image uh, implementation. Um, maybe some people have heard of NerdCTL. This is an interesting project created by one of our maintainers that gives you a more Docker compatible CLI. So if you don't like the limitations of CTR, which uh, is the container D client, you can try out NerdCTL, which includes all kinds of interesting things like it, it sets up rootless uh, container support for you. It, it builds in the StarGZ snapshot or support. Uh, it builds in build kit support so you can have Docker build capabilities. Um, so again, these are interesting things that are related to, to the project, uh, but aren't necessarily core. Um, many of the others, so again, ContainerD is our main repo that we'll look at most of the, the time I think we're talking. Um, but of course, there are many uh, pieces that exist around that console support, C groups, which is actually used by uh, other uh, projects outside of ContainerD, like our C groups implementation. Uh, we've got our website, TTRPC, which is the uh, lightweight gRPC client. And when we look at the architecture, that's how the shim actually talks to uh, uh, the ContainerD daemon itself, managing that run C process uh, that I talked about. Uh, and again, there are many others here. We, we built some release tooling. Um, we have some other non-core capabilities like uh, the implementation of image encryption. Um, so again, that's that's kind of what you'll see here. There's, uh, I guess, 24 total repositories. Again, probably uh, 17, 18 of those are core to the project, and uh, 5 to 10 of them are non-core. Um, and there's also tooling uh, sub-projects in the website. It feels um, like there's lots of different ways for people to get involved. You know, if like container D slash container D is maybe too in depth at first, you can maybe pick one of those fringe product uh, projects that, and kind of dip your toe in earlier. Yeah, um, absolutely. And and Nerd CTL is interesting because um, you know it has a bunch of contributors who maybe aren't all that interested in developing a container runtime, but they are. Uh, they find it easier to jump in with. Hey, I could implement, you know, Docker inspect or or Docker PS, and so NerdCTL has uh, quickly grown into a, a very active project where a lot of different contributors are implementing, you know, other pieces of, of the sort of standard Docker uh, client syntax uh, for ContainerD. Nice. Um, I thought it might be good. That may be too small. Um, Let me make that a bit bigger. If that helps. Yeah, so a quick look at the um, at a rough architecture diagram may help us as we kind of look at the container D core uh, main repo. So as I talked about, th there's all these consumers kind of at the top, whether it's a cloud or a specific tool or capability, and they're probably uh, calling into container D via various methods. And so the client options are really to use the Go uh, API. And so, uh, again, you can use standard um, Go package uh, documentation for container D slash container D and see all the, uh, the, the Go APIs. 
Um, if you're the, if you're coming from a Kubernetes context, um, you're obviously Kubelet will be calling ContainerD via the gRPC CRI API, um, and then plugins within ContainerD like the CRI plugin uh, will be calling the Go API um, to drive ContainerD to do the things Kubelet is asking it to do, such as start this pod or uh, you know pull this image. And then we export uh, Prometheus metrics as well out of the engine. So that next level, the core, is really um, what you would assume is, is the implementation of the container runtime. All the, we've broken it up into various gRPC services you know, for images and namespaces and snapshots and tasks. And then, of course, each of those services has some metadata associated with that. So BoltDB is used uh, as the metadata store uh, to hold, you know, these images and the references and the content uh, and the actual containers themselves. Uh, and then at the back end, it's, uh, you have all the various snapshot implementations, so ButterFS, DevMapper, Overlay. Uh, and again, you could, that's pluggable. You can even have external snapshotters like the StarGZ snapshotter project. Um, and how all this actually talks to, to runtimes or via the shim client, uh, which is talking to uh, the other side of that shim is, is running run C and actually your containerized process behind that. But again, that's pluggable as well. You can write your own shim for something other than run C. And so we have shims for Firecracker, for lightweight virtualization, uh, Kata containers, again, lightweight virtualization, Microsoft has run HCS, which runs uh, the Windows containers. Uh, Google has a, a Gvisor. Um, uh, I can't remember if they actually have a shim or if they just have a run C uh, replacement. Um, but again, this is a pluggable backend side of, of ContainerD. Uh, if, you know, the sky's the limit as far as if you can implement the shim API, you can drive whatever kind of process isolation you want behind that uh, simply by having your own shim. Um, so if I haven't overwhelmed people, that's <laughs> like uh, kind of the, the high level view as we look into the actual repo, um, how you know we'll find the, the layout of packages and directories in container D will map to this architecture. So if we look um, uh, at the main containerd repo, uh, again, lots and lots of, of content here. Um, there will be a, a quiz. Um, so <laughs> the, pro probably the, you know, I don't want to bore people with talking about every, every possible thing. So I think the best way to start thinking about it is there are a set of files and, and first level directories that represent that Go API. And so you can see down here container.go and container checkpoint and op options and um, diff and events and, and uh, image, image store. These are all, uh, if, we, if we go look at the, um, actually we should just open that so it, it may help, um, help people uh, see that more clearly. If I open up the, um, the Go doc, then we'll see um, a lot of these these same things. We have the ContainerD client. So again, all, all the ways you can uh, use the client to talk to a running uh, ContainerD uh, daemon, uh, various options for that. Uh, there are obviously packages for each of the services. So uh, the gRPC services, images, uh, all the options for when you're starting a container, uh, so again, if you're using the Go API, uh, you're going to say with image and reference an image, and then there's options on how you want that pulled, uh, various snapshot options. Uh, if you want to write your own OCI run C spec with your own um, options in there, then you can actually uh, pass a spec. So again, the Go API is fairly rich. This is actually how the CRI implementation in ContainerD uses ContainerD. So it actually uses the Go API to drive ContainerD, like creating a new container, creating a new task. Uh, so that's that's mostly the files in this um, 
root directory here, or a lot of the implementation of the Go API. And then at one level down, there's a lot of the the metadata and implementation, you know, references and uh, the uh, namespaces and metadata service and labels and leases. Uh, so again, a lot of the implementation uh, of those services we saw are are within those directories. If if you came to ContainerD and said, you know, actually the gRPC API. I'd like to enrich it in some way. Again, this is defined in protobufs. And so uh, we have these text files here with some documentation. Uh, if you wanted to change how the services are actually implemented, you would start by changing an API definition here. And then in our make file, there's our targets to actually rebuild the protobufs. And then of course you have to wire that up to those directories where actual implementations of those services are uh, in container D. Um, some of the snapshotters are built in and some of them are, are um, external to the project. So again, if you're looking for the overlay uh, snapshotter, it's built in, but uh, some of the others are, are actual repos uh, within the broader container D org. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of nice kind of helpers. So anything to do with OCI. So you're obviously when you start a container in container D, uh, you'll get a default spec with whatever, um, you know, if you're using CTR or nerd CTL and you've, you specified a volume mount, obviously at some point that will end up generating a entry in the OCI spec. Uh, but all that's implemented uh, here in the OCI subder. Um, for interacting with Run C. Um, what else is interesting? Uh, under the package uh, directory, so one of the interesting things is that this year uh, we changed CRI from being a totally different sub repo within the ContainerD org, and we migrated and merged that into the ContainerD code base itself. We were doing a lot of kind of this iterative vendoring. Uh, so you fix something in CRI. And then you fix, you know, what it's using in container D and then you have to re-vendor CRI back into container D to make a build and then release it. And so we hope this, um, you know, helps people uh, develop and use the CRI uh, if you're a developer um, to uh, enable kind of quicker iteration on changes in the CRI. And so uh, you can see the CRI subder here, this is most of the implementation of that CRI API from Kublet. And again, um, you know, if we look in server, uh, here's a, a container create. And so again, if if you're using container D as your Kublet's runtime, uh, the CRI call um, to create a container will come through here. And then, uh, you know, if we look at this, it's actually using container D's uh, API to do that container create. And so it's that linkage between CRI and container D being used as a, uh, via the Go API. Um, so that's, that's kind of a fairly high level um, overview of the layout of the code. I'm trying to think if there's anything else uh, worth digging into, but I, I Again, it's it's a big project. There is a, there yeah. is quite a bit of code here, um, but it's it's uh, you know most people find that you're not making a change that cr that crosses you know this entire repo. Um, you know, I personally am not necessarily an expert on our snapshotters. There are other people who are, and so I if you looked in the snapshotters uh, projects and directories, you'd find very few changes for me. I've been focused more on other parts of the the engine. So, you know, that's totally fine as well. Contributors can have a focus area, an area where they feel more comfortable. And, uh, you know, we have plenty of contributors that cover uh, the code base. Nice. I think just I'll try and summarize that in 10 seconds as best as I can, even though there was a whole lot of information there. But, you know, if you're coming to the project and you want to make a change to the API, the first place to start would either be the, the protobuf files, which have the descriptions, or those go files in a top-level directory, directory, which map to the API. 
and then you've got a nice clean directory structure with subdirectories for all of the different components that those APIs have to interact with. Did I get anything wrong? <laughs> yeah, no, that's, no. that's great. All right. Awesome. Thank you uh, very much for that. Shall we, do you have a closed locally where we go through the development experience, the build process and take a look at how we can get this running? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, just like any other project, you know, your, your starting point is to clone the container D repo, yep. uh, get it set up in some local environment. Uh, I guess it, it's, it's probably good to mention, uh, we have a, um, uh, building um, dot md entry here. Just talking about building, um, you know, the dev environment. Um, yep. They're actually today, other than installing Go um, and potentially installing the ButterFS headers and library for your Linux distro. Um, there's really very few kind of prereqs that that would be very difficult. In fact, this whole section on uh, installing the buff compiler, if you're never going to change the API, um, you actually don't even, you know, you don't need the, the protobuf compiler installed. Um, so yeah, the, the other part of it is that um, if you don't have run C installed on your system, which again, um, is almost hard to, to do today because most distros will um, install some container runtime components that will uh, install probably a reasonable version of Run C. Um, but were that not the case, you would want to clone the Run C repository and again run these um, fairly straightforward commands to install Run C. Um, and a, a little shout out that Run C. Used to we used to care a lot about which version of Run C you installed. We you could look in our our vendoring um, uh, go dot mod file and find the right uh, release tag and build that. But Run C is currently voting on the v 1.0.0 uh, release, so Run C is finally going to be 1.0 final. Um, and so you know any kind of reasonable 1.0 install of run c should work fine with container d there's there's less of this kind of um, interrelationship between versions of run c and versions of container d that you have to worry about anymore nice. uh, but again if if you're uh, interested in the exact version we build we actually have created a um, a new file which um, i just blanked on where we have that <laughs> um, but again, I, what we tried to do was separate out vendoring from which version we build for CI, um, because it, again, those things don't absolutely have to be linked anymore. But if you do look at our Go mod, uh, and again, we use Go mod vendoring. We finally went through the pain of switching to Go mod and getting all our, uh, vendoring. We, we do have a, uh, a little bit of a complex replace uh, rule um, uh, set up here. So if you're going to vendor container D, um, you need to also do these same uh, replacements. And there's some tricks here with empty mod, uh, which you can go read the, the PR about that. Um, people much much more skilled in the art of, of Go mod uh, set that up. But yeah. Again, run C here. You can see we're using 1.0.0. RC95. Uh, so again, that was a little bit of a roundabout uh, description of what are the prereqs. Uh, once you have run C and the ButterFS headers and some reasonable version of Go, I have 1.16.5 here. Uh, and then the only other comment I was going to make is that, uh, believe it or not. Containerd builds on Mac OS, like natively, <laughs> not as a container. Uh, and there are people working on, you know, there's a couple open issues, and I think even a PR uh, about using some BSD kernel um, capabilities to actually run containers. So you, you can't run containers on Mac, but you can build the project. And we even run CI, uh, our, our every PR CI 
make sure the build isn't broken. Um, and even, uh, I want to say it has a short test suite, but I'm not sure if I'm right about that. We can go look. Um, right. So yeah, but mostly you're going to want to be on Linux, but hey, if you want to build on Mac, you can do that. I had um, no idea that was that was possible. That actually makes things a lot easier for developers that are working on a Mac then. So that's, that's nice. Yeah. Yeah. And, and again, uh, Akihiro, who wrote NerdCTL, uh, many people know him. He did a lot of the work in rootless uh, containers along with folks from Creo and Red Hat. Uh, yeah. He uh, has a new project. Uh, I want to say it's called Nema. Uh, but he's he's always getting the point with NerdCTL, Containerd, and Lima to have like a Docker desktop like experience on Mac. So it starts a small VM, Linux VM, uh, so you can actually you know, use NerdCTL as the client on Mac, driving the uh, the Linux embedded VM, similar to how Docker Desktop works. So if you're interested in that, that's an interesting new project to play with as well. But back to Linux, uh, we're here <laughs> at our command line. Uh, I've checked out the project. I have Run C. I have uh, the uh, you know, all the necessary prerequisites. Probably the most interesting, you know, easy thing to do as far as building is make binaries. That's going to build CTR, which is, uh, again, the simple client, uh, which, you know, if you read through our readme, we say is unsupported. We mean that in the sense that, like, CTR isn't part of that API contract that we offer in Containerd. Um, it's simply a, a, um, a sort of nice admin type tool um, you know, nerd CTL is much more feature rich now. Uh, but again, CTR is there. Container D is the daemon itself. Um, we build a, a stress tool. That's just an interesting, uh, use case for, for trying to test, um, container D, you know, 24 seven, just running containers, tasks, image pulls. Um, and one of the maintainers has a, has a live system constantly running that on every uh, commit. Um, and then there are three shims, um, and I, I won't spend a ton of time here, but the shim API has has um, matured over the, the four or five years that the project's been around. And so we're now on the, uh, the V2 version of the shim, which is actually the second two, run CV1 and run CV2. Some of these enhancements to the Shim API uh, came about because of users like Kata Containers and others who needed a more rich API for that management of containerized processes. Uh, obviously, you can think of uh, lightweight virtualization as needing uh, sort of more management and metadata about that VM, things that aren't necessarily part of like the Run C spec. And so again, the Shim API has matured to support those use cases. And so we currently build the old legacy Shim and then uh, the two modern Shims. Uh, again, if you were going to play with Firecracker or Kata, uh, you could go uh, download those projects. They will build their Shims. You could install that. And then your this container D that we just built could use uh, those other Shims uh, that are built out of tree in those projects. Um, so yeah, building does not take long as you saw, it's just a minute or two. Pretty fast. Um, yeah. Now the fun part is say, I want to play around with this version. If you've installed Docker, like I have on this VM, um, <laughs> Docker also uses container D. I think most people know that, but I didn't say that in the opening. Um, Docker has a, in the old packaging, Docker actually delivered Containerd. Now most Ubuntu distributions have their own Containerd package, and Docker has its own package, and simply depends on the Containerd service uh, running most likely through System D on your machine. So, because I have Docker running and it's already using the Containerd installed, I I usually play tricks in my environment to either shut down Docker. Uh, replace container D or point to container D in slash user local. There's also things you can do like start container D listening on a different um, Unix socket. And so then 
um, you know, I could basically run this container D even while Docker is, is depending on my system container D, if you want to call it that. Um, and then when I test it or run CTR commands, I can simply point at that Unix socket. And so, um, actually, I wanted to point to this one. So the, what I was talking about is that when I run containerd, I can set the address for the gRPC server that defaults um, to uh, it defaults to a um, containerd.soc in this um, root own directory. So this is the my system, if you want to call it that, my system level container D is mm -hmm. running and listening on this socket. Um, so if I want to run um, the one I just built, I can do address um, run container D, uh, you know, some, some other socket. So yep. if we uh, if we now go look down run container D, there should be <laughs> what did I do? <laughs> Run community private dot uh, uh, yeah. So more fun. I it's still reading my container D config in. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's still reading this config. So I'd all I would also need to um, basically create another config obviously just like I did with a different socket and I would need to set up the gRPC address to be different um, than the default. So again, one, one way to, if I'm happy just running the, um, the tests, um, I think I actually made container. I think I'm stuck in a gRPC, uh, timeout uh, trying to contend with that other socket because uh. it ignored my address <laughs> on the command line. So we can, we can fix that. Um, but uh, <clears throat> so um, that was far too nice. nice you, didn't, you didn't do a dash nine. <laughs> I would have, I would have just have shot it in the head. But. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, the, the nice thing is the, the test suite does this for you. So the integration part of the test suite will start its own container D on its own, uh, socket with its own config. And so the, the nice thing is if I, if I run make test, um, uh, you know, I'm not going to have a problem having this weird interaction with the system level container D, um, and so again, that this will probably take a good while. Uh, I, we can leave it running for a minute. If there are other questions or things we want to poke into, um, you know, again, that's your basic dev environment. Uh, make binaries, make tests, make integration. Um, I think the it, it may be well. I'll, I'll give you a chance to tell me what you'd like to to poke at next. Um, but it may also be worth uh, noting that our CI is set up to use GitHub Actions. And so, uh, you know, for for every, actually, that's that's painful to look at the YAML. We should just look at a PR. <laughs> and we'll look at one of my PRs. And... What's, what's painful about looking yeah. at YAML? <laughs> So this this kind of gives you a feel for what's going to happen. And again, maybe maybe I'm jumping ahead. If we're going to do a, an issue and a pull request, we, we'll get back to this. But as I mentioned, we're cross building uh, to make sure build is working across a, a number of architectures, including uh, my colleague Sam Carp just added FreeBSD mm -hmm. support recently, and that's still uh, maturing. And it has a Run C uh, alike. Uh, 
replacement called Run J that's its own separate project. So again, we're cross we're linting across various arc, uh, OSs. We're cross building across various uh, CPU and architecture pairs. We're then building all the binaries and then running integration. Uh, and I, I was right. We do run the unit tests on Mac. Uh, Linux integration with a bunch of matrix uh, of different uh, of those shims. Uh, and also running against C run, which is a C, uh, uh, a replacement for run C written in C that Red Hat created. Um, so again, this is this is kind of what happens when you create a PR. Um, you know, all all these steps are going to happen uh, in GitHub Actions to validate that your change isn't breaking a set of architectures, a set of operating systems, and then running the the tests. Okay, so let me clarify a few things there. So, you know, the feedback loop for a new contributor coming to the project, you know, they, they clone the project like they do with any other Git repository. Um, a pretty solid way to start, I guess, would just be running make real uh, binaries, which will just ensure that you have the correct tool chain and everything that you need to actually build the project. So if you just get that out of the way, I guess it's going to save them a lot of time. And if you do run into errors, the chances are you need the bar FS headers, potentially some protobuf compilers. And I think that was it, actually. So maybe those two. Yeah, yeah, just the Go tool chain and those two things. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, it's, it's become such an easy question these days when you ask someone how to build a Go project. You know, if you go back just 18 months, it was like, well, which vendoring tool or which dependency <laughs> tool are we using? But Go mod really has kind of taken over. And it's great to see that a lot of these bigger projects are also adopting it as well. So. Just running a Go build should, for anyone coming to this who's got at least Go 113, I think it is, um, should just pull everything down. Yeah. Is there a minimum Go dependency on Containerd or does, is it not too fast? Yeah, I, um, I think we've said 113. I, I don't know if our development main branch, so we just released 1.5 um, recently, which I know... I guess what I'm why I'm hesitating is I'm not sure if there's anything in the current development branch that is using. Uh, so, for example, there, uh, Golang has package errors, mm -hmm. and we started using errors dot is I think, which is I don't remember which Go release that came in, uh, but it might be higher than one thirteen now. Uh, but that's a great first PR for someone if if you. <laughs> If you, if you want to update our README, if we're wrong about our minimum version. So nice. We, uh, we also forgot to mention, you pointed out there was a, a building markdown file in the root of the repos repository, so people should definitely run through that as well. Um, yep. There were two other make file targets that you mentioned. There were uh, make tests, which is already ran, was pretty quick. It looks like, is that just running the unit tests? And I think you said there was a yep. make integration as well. Yeah, so so make um, integration is what's going to actually start a Containerd instance. So um, that's not going to work on a Mac, right? That's <laughs> that's a yeah. Linux Linux only. Yeah, so this needs Run C to be installed because yeah. obviously it's going to be starting and stopping containers. It needs uh, <laughs> it needs root um, <laughs> uh, because that has to start the uh, Containerd daemon. Um, and you're going to need an internet connection and hope uh, the container registries uh, we use during integration are not having downtime or an outage because it'll be pulling images, um, you know, some basic images to run all the tests. So uh, we have a bit of flakiness sometimes in CI uh, because, you know, we're doing a lot of registry interactions. Yeah. Uh, uh, but yeah. I think, I guess, you know, if you're making your first contribution to the project, you know, you, you'll know which parts of the system you're hopefully trying to change. Unit tests may be enough to get that PR up. And if you're doing anything that modifies maybe container creation, the integration tests are probably quite a good thing to run as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Okay. Uh, so maybe we could take a look at the pull request format. I, I don't know if you have a, a trivial issue you'd like us to work on or you want to just run through a... In pull request, it's up to you, but if we could just maybe take a look at the template and talk about some of the conventions that Container D Project uses there too. Yeah, so let's look at issues for a second. I don't think we've 
have a template for uh, PRs, but we definitely uh, formalized our issue template over the last couple of years. Uh, we have enabled GitHub discussions in the last year. Um, and so this is kind of a nice way to keep people from opening an issue that's just like a ge general question. Um, and we also added a link to try and get people to join CNCF Slack um, and point out that the ContainerD and ContainerD dev channels exist there for people's questions and a little more interactive way to to talk to community members. Um, the only distinction there in the channel names, um, ContainerD we see is like anybody, end users, you're playing around, you're trying it out. ContainerD-dev, we, um, we, uh, we assume that's someone who's interested in maybe contributing or has a question about how it's built or you know, is trying to extend it in some way or use it in their project. Uh, again, you know, we, we're fine if people uh, mix that up from time to time, but that's kind of the, the split of the channels. Um, we uh, also uh, formalized our security policy, so I'd, I'd shown uh, some of that. Um, and so this is kind of nice because we can link directly to that. Um, and so what's left is, uh, again, just straightforward templates for I found a bug, um, which, again, looks like a lot of other um, templates out there. What did you do? What results? Uh, what did you expect? And then we ask, you know, for some output of version, um, you know, show us if it's uh, relevant, your run C version, your CRI configuration, what kernel you're on. Um, and then we, we've we've tried to toss in some helpful, um, you know, way, you know, if container is hung, can you provide us a stack trace uh, by, you know, following these commands? Um, so, yeah, fairly straightforward. Uh, people that follow this uh, get a lot more help because if, if they don't do this, um, you know, our first response usually is, can you provide, you know, version, details, et cetera. So as usual, as with most, most projects, we love people who kind of follow the, uh, the format and, and give us as much detail as possible. The other um, template is just, you know, I want, Container to do container D to do this new thing, um, and so uh, gives you a chance to describe that and provide context, what you're trying to accomplish. Um, so and I think we can see. Go oh, ahead. Yeah, I, I was just curious. You know, if, if I'm coming to the project and I've got a great idea for like a new feature, um, you know, is opening an issue to start a discussion the best way? Is having a pull request with a proof of concept the best way? Is there an RSC process like? I guess for smaller changes, that's not important, but maybe larger ones it is. Yeah, so um, yeah, so we, we have not ever felt the need for like a full kind of um, formal proposal process, you know, for new ideas or new features. Um, obviously, it can be really helpful if, if it's not a minor thing to, you know, just join one of those channels, the ContainerD dev, obviously, if we're talking about new feature implementation and just you know pose it there because you may find out that the maintainers have already thought about that or there's already a poc or there's there's something they didn't find as they were looking through um, but opening an issue is 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 definitely a, a reasonable alternative or, or next step uh, for example uh, cause one of our reviewers just added this uh, a few days ago um, that's you know should we add health checks like Docker had, like Docker Engine has? How would we do that? What are the pros and cons? That's something he had already chatted with with the maintainers. Should you know? Do you, do you all think that this is something worth uh, considering? And we're like, yeah, you know, open a, open a feature label on that. Uh, again, the the template provides that labeling, and then we can uh, potentially add more labels like Windows. Um, or, or other uh, interesting labels on the issues. Do you have any labels that are you know keen for people to look out for for new or or simpler issues? Yeah, so um, we do. We we've done maybe a, a poor job than we'd like to on um, 
you know, marking like experienced beginner, expert, intermediate, help yeah. wanted. These were labels we created to try, you know, especially in the early days, trying to help people understand where they could fit in. Um, so we, we've just started to try and have some more community calls. So live, you know, Zoom yeah. call and um, hopefully we can uh, get some folks interested in, in kind of helping us triage issues that uh, like every open source project, it's can be um, difficult to get enough time to to do this kind of grooming of, of the yeah, issue definitely. list. So it just sounds like if, if someone new is coming then and they can navigate the issues and find something that's relatively simple for them to pick up, the community calls may be a good way to start a discussion or the container D dev channel on the CNCF Slack and just say, hey, I want to contribute. I don't know how to start. And hopefully someone there will help you out. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so what about the the pull request process then itself? When I when I open one and create one, um, is there anything that I need to know there that's different? Are there any slash commands? Does I have to assign an issue to anyone, or do I just open it and hope for the best? Yeah. So, um, you know, my my workflow um, is that I, I tend not to really use this new pull request. I mean, obviously you can use this and select a branch um, yep. and prepare changes. But in my my workflow, you know, I, I have something I want to do. Uh, I'm just going to, you know, check out a new branch, uh, fix something. Um, I'm going to go, you know, edit that file. Maybe it's, maybe it's I found out that we need that's interesting, except 1.14. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, that Can't is interesting. 1.13 is okay, 1.15 is okay, but no, you cannot use 1.14 <laughs> without a I comment. Think that was, yeah, I think that was when um, there was that issue with signaling, uh, sig, sig int interrupt, and writes and reads potentially needing to handle interrupt. Anyway, uh, so let's say we found out that, that we needed 115 and now uh, I guess we can leave. So, you know, I've made this change. Um, I'm gonna commit it, update um, minimum. Is there any format on commit messages like conventional commits yes. or? Um, so the, we do have uh, project checks that run early in those GitHub actions. Uh, the format we want is the, the standard um, validation that a lot of other projects use. So Docker uses this, Run C uses it. And so it expects like a, a sort of title, I guess we'll call it, uh, up to 75 characters, then a blank line. Um, I realized we, then some kind of description, we now need 1.15.x container D. And then you need a signed off by um, and what we would like you to do is use your real name. And so some people, you know, put their GitHub ID here, but, uh, again, for the DCO, um, compliance, we'd like people to use their, their real name and then, um, a, obviously their, uh, email. And so this is, this is the, the format, um, that we expect and that we'll, fail CI if you don't follow this, if there's no signed off by line, uh, or if this is all on one huge line, yep. uh, it'll, it'll air out on CI. Um, and so, you know, I can now push this. Um, and so I, I tend to just, um, you know, again, push the, this has been pushed to my fork of container D and so now, um, if I just go to the container D, uh, GitHub has this nice feature where it's like, oh, you just push something. Uh, do you want a pull request? Yes, I do. And so the nice thing is you'll see that, you know, it's using that, that sort of title line of my commit as the title of the PR. Uh, and then everything else is just put in inside the first comment. Yep. Um, and again, there's the diff of my change. Um, <clears throat> and Obviously, I could create that. I, I guess I'm not going to because I have no idea if that's really true. 
but what's going to happen is that um, automatically a few things will happen. First, uh, sadly, because of crypto mining, if you've never contributed to ContainerD or any of these repos, it will not run CI uh, until one of us um, with commit access to the repo uh, clicks a button that says authorize, you know, run running of CI. Um, the other thing is that because the CRI project is now integrated into ContainerD, we have two other things outside of GitHub Actions that are happening on every PR. Uh, one is that we're actually running um, uh, the, uh, I forget the, the end-to-end -end tests uh, for ContainerD and Kubelet. Um, we're also running ARM64 uh, because GitHub Actions doesn't have uh, integrated support for ARM64 yet, um, we uh, Open Lab runs ARM64 builds and tests and integration. Uh, sadly, <laughs> this didn't work. Um, uh, Open Lab was having an issue when I opened this PR, so it didn't run. Uh, but th those things are going to happen. And again, if you're a new contributor, it's going to force one of the ContainerD members to authorize the end-to-end -end test to run. Um, and there are a few slash commands that the robot will uh, comment and show you uh, if, if you uh, don't know what you're doing or don't, don't know how to re, if a test fails and you want to re-execute it. Um, we don't, unlike you know Kubernetes, which has a lot of uh, interesting integration, uh, there aren't a ton of like slash commands or robots operating here other than this one that runs the end-to-end -end tests. Um, and so we don't have auto merge or any of those other things. So at that point, most of what you're going to want to care about is that you haven't broken CI. And if you don't understand why something failed, just comment and ask, a, um, say, hey, this doesn't look related to my PR. Can someone help me um, figure out why this didn't work? Um, and then, yeah, you're looking for two different maintainers or reviewers to LGTM uh, your PR, and then it will be merged. Um, and they may, we may add labels like, hey, this is a really important bug fix. It should be cherry picked back to an existing release. And so maintainers will add those labels and may ask you and even give you the commands like, can you please cherry pick this commit uh, against the release branch 1.4 or 1.5. Nice. Awesome. So yeah, I think that's that's pretty much uh Yeah, that's perfect. How PRs work. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Thank you very much. All right, let's uh jump back over here. So that is our whirlwind guide to contributing to container D. I hope you all got a lot of useful information there. Um I think the really important bits to get to I think the really important bits to take home there are that if you do want to contribute to container D, be involved in the CNCF Slack. Uh, and the container D and container D dev channels. Uh, I'm sure there'll be lots of interesting and helpful people there willing to help you out. Uh, the issue queue is there. Get involved, open issues wherever possible. If it's anything bigger, maybe open a discussion first and uh, try and get some people to discuss the idea with you, make sure it makes sense for the project and take it forward from there. As far as building and testing goes, there's make file targets for everything. So it should be hopefully nice and simple. And uh, that's it. Have fun contributing to Container D. Um, Phil, thank you so much for joining us today and, and, and walking us through that. There was a lot of knowledge there to be shared and hope everyone else finds it as useful as I did. Cool. Yeah, thanks for having me. Awesome. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, what time is this? In one hour, Pop will be here with Spotlight and they will be doing a six-store root key ceremony. So come and check that one out. Phil, thank you again. I will speak to you soon and have a great day. Thanks. Bye. Bye, everybody. Thank <laughs> you.